Um, so I'm going to ask Kevin if he would open us with a word of prayer before we start. Amen. Um, does everybody have a copy of To Be a Christian? Okay. Um, I'm sorry? Okay. Would you go into the curate's office and get four or five copies of that for me, please? Once Pam comes back, if you don't have a copy, um, she'll give you a copy. I think we have enough copy per couple or per single. I think we'll do well. So we're going to start... Um, I think we kind of decided once we began this that um, since we had uh, adjusted the class, broadened it a little bit uh, from what it would have been in the small pamphlet that you would have received, that it was better to just give you the catechism. And so this, what we're doing is a sweeping survey um, through these points. Uh, And of course, the catechism is much broader than these points. We will be doing a deep dive into Anglicanism uh, later this fall. Um, so we will also use uh, the, uh, the catechism book that you have, so you want to keep that handy. But we will go into considerably more depth, and it will be on uh, other points other than what we covered just for confirmation. Is that clear as mud? Okay. So I'm going to give you the page number, uh, and I find that Kindle sometimes mixes up the page numbers, but it's Point two fifty six, page ninety in my Kindle book, uh, but it's more importantly it's point two fifty six, the Ten Commandments, and we will recite those Ten Commandments as we open this morning. Let me know when you find it. Point two fifty six. Pa- it's page ninety in the Kindle, but it may not page be 91. page ninety one in the hard copy. So we're going to begin and recite the Ten Commandments together. I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods but me. You shall not make for yourself any idol. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet. And these are found in the Book of Common Prayer references Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5. And we look at what exactly the Ten Commandments are. And of course, they're what? They are a summary and outline of God's law. Um, If you want to look at exactly what his law is, it's... uh, Uh, Defined in Hebrew as Torah, instruction, it's God's direct pronouncement of his will, both for our good and for his glory. And sometimes we concentrate on the negative aspect of the law, but the law was full of positives. Um, It's very proactive in the way that we live our life. Does anybody want to venture a guess as to how Jesus summarized the entire law? He made it very, very simple. Help me out here. That's right. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So it's summed up in that. And I want you to keep a thought in the back of your mind as we survey through these ten commandments this morning as to how each commandment speaks either to our relationship with God and or our relationship with each other, with man. It's important kind of to keep that uh, present. How did Jesus uh, fulfill God's law? He 
His relationship with the Father is perfect, that's, that, and that certainly is one side of it. He, he presented to us uh, the perfect example, uh, and he submitted to it completely. Um, but unfortunately, that's not enough for us, is it? Uh, because try as we might, we are going to miss it uh, as far as the law is concerned. So what else uh, did, how, how else did Jesus fulfill the law? He became the perfect sacrifice for our sin. That's right. He became the perfect sacrifice for our sin. He died. He took our sins upon him. Uh, and, and he provided an atonement uh, for our sin. And we know that we're not able uh, to fulfill the law completely because of our corrupted human nature. We are fallen on all sides. Um, when, when the fall occurred, it wasn't a stumble. Uh, it, was a, it was a complete fall. Uh, and it's reflected, as we're, going to, as we're going to talk this morning, it's reflected in area, every area of our lives, but it's also reflected in every area of society. So we look at this not only, uh, as I mentioned this morning in the sermon, we tend to interpret individually, uh, but most of the world's population inter would interpret this collectively or as a group, as a body. So we, we are a fallen humanity. Uh, I'll never forget uh, when I was working on my doctorate at Gordon-Conwell, the director of the behavioral sciences department would inevitably every single day uh, say we are fallen creatures uh, as we grappled with uh, the way that sin manifests itself in our lives and in the lives of others. Uh, the earth has fallen, so we, we need to always keep that uh, close in our minds. We, we live in a fallen world. We live in a fallen world, and we should never be surprised to see sin or sin. Can I say something? I saw a absolutely. cartoon once, and the cartoon was there's a sign over the door to the church, and it says, no good Christians are allowed here, just regular sinners. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's us. So the Ten Commandments help us to resist evil by teaching that God judges the corrupt affections of the fallen world, the cruel str strategies of the devil, and the sinful desires of our own heart, and th that teaches us to renounce them. Sometimes we hit the mark, many times we do not. Okay. How do the Ten Commandments help us to grow in likeness to Christ? This is point 266. How do they help us to grow in likeness to Christ? We reveal? Please. We reveal our sin in the light of God's righteousness, guide you to Christ, and teach you what is pleasing to God. They do. And how should we keep the Ten Commandments? Because they both contain God's prohibitions against evil and direct us toward his good will. We should both repent uh, when we disobey them, and we should seek by his grace to live according to them. And I think as we look at this list, um, now don't tell me you don't do this because I know you do. You, you, you go through that list, you think, which one is the one that I really stumble with the most? If you haven't thought of that already, you will as we go through. It's, because the easiest thing in the world is to say, well, I don't, that, that one's not a problem, that one's not a problem. And human tendency is to always judge others because they sin in a different way than we sin, if that makes sense. Uh, but I think we, what we find that, that we have to assimilate today is that sin, sin is sin. The law teaches us that sin is sin. And then we will see in the New Testament that some of the most, uh, what the church today would consider abhorrible sins our, Paul puts in the same text as he would, do not covet, or do not gossip, do not slander. So let's look at the first commandment. Would somebody like to once again recite the first commandment? I am the Lord your God, you shall have no other gods before me. Okay, and you'll see the scripture references there on page 268. Um, 
When we talk about the Lord being our God, we're talking about he is our Lord in his entirety. He is Lord over all of our life, every single uh, jot and tittle of our lives. He, he is Lord over it. Um, and when he says to have no other gods, I think as Westerners, it's fairly easy for us to give ourselves uh, you know, kind of an escape on that one because we do have no other gods, do we? Do we or not? I'm, I'm reminded of the words of a visiting church official from East India as he made his first trip to the United States. And when we go to India, um, as believers, depending on where we are, most of my times in India have been in North India, we're, we're impacted by, uh, by Islam in Northern India uh, and by sprinkling of Hinduism, so it, it meets us full force, and that's what we pick up on. And ironically, this um, visiting official from the Indian church said, you know, he said, I, I was so impacted by the evil of materialism when I came to the United States. So um, when, when we say that we have no other gods before him, this is a daily exercise in faith. Uh, what is most important to us? Uh, what, what takes up our attention? And um, you don't have to make a list, but it's just, uh, just a good thing to contemplate. Um, why are we tempted to worship other things rather than God? What's at the root of it, I should say? That's easier. Again, we live in a fallen world. We reflect that fall. Even as redeemed uh, creatures of God, we reflect that fall. Uh, how are you tempted to worship other gods? And rather than, this is point 272, rather than the general answer that they give, think for a moment where this temptation shows up greatest in your life, where you're tempted to give something or somebody a more prominent place than you do God. I'm tempted to trust in myself, my pleasures, my possessions, my relationships, my success, wrongly believing that they will bring me happiness, security, and meaning. I'm also tempted to believe superstitions and false religious claims and to reject God's call to worship him alone. Uh, so we all have friends, hopefully, that are on, are on journeys that have taken them elsewhere other than to God. And we watch them in that journey try to fill the desire, what we sometimes call the God-shaped hole that's in our heart. Uh, they try to fill that with so many things, but with great dissatisfaction. You feel free to weigh in any time. You too. I'm sorry. You feel free to weigh in any time. Okay. Um, can you worship and serve God perfectly? Are we capable of doing that? And and why not? I'm sorry? Because we're not perfect. That's right. So this morning, this, uh, today's sermon is about the Eucharist. How, uh, the question that came to my mind is, how does God make a bit of a correction in our inability to worship him perfectly? <laughs> he gives us the Holy Spirit. Right? He gives us the Spirit. He's present as we celebrate the Eucharist. Uh, as, I, as I said, we don't have to worry about our errors because he's there. His presence is there. And he has forgiven us, and we know that he presents himself as our intercessor. Even earlier in the service, we confess our sins, and then we hear the words that you're forgiven. What grace is that? Amen. That is so beautiful. So we can come to the table as forgiven, the forgiven people of God. Yes, we do. We can 
come with confidence? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Would somebody like to recite a scripture that uh, addresses that, the confidence we can have when we come before the Lord? Anybody have that on the top of their... That's a good one. Walk boldly, therefore, to the throne of God. Boldly. Now, the, now the boldness isn't in our own capacity. Uh, we, but I do believe that it's okay to be bold in the work that Christ has done and is doing in our lives. It's a bold work, isn't it? That's right. Absolutely. Um, the scripture, be filled with the spirit speaking to yourself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. The interesting thing about that verse is uh, in the Greek, it's, it's a, uh, a different form of the word uh, B, it's be being, be being filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. In other words, be in the process of being filled by His Spirit uh, at all times. It, it, it is not a one-time uh, sufficient for all, but we have to walk uh, in that, allowing Him to fill us. So still, the greater, greater responsibility is with God. What is the second commandment, if somebody would like to recite that? I think probably um, as recent as a few decades ago, this wouldn't have had as much uh, relevance to our culture as it does today. But we we li we live in a in an era that's filled with re a good thing, religious hunger, spiritual hunger, but also um, a very very broad array of ways that people are trying to express that and to fill that. Uh, and we we return to having no other gods before him. And again, we are looking at idols. Our idols, point 279, are idols always images? Can somebody give me an example of when uh, an idol uh, is something else? That's right. That's right. We are to enjoy fully what God's given us uh, and understand that there could be a time when we don't have that. And like Paul, we should be able to say, I've learned to be content in, in whatever state. Um, can I just throw this out and muddy the water a little bit? I believe that feelings can become an idol. Um, I think when, whenever we have to have a particular feeling moving in us in order to uh, really be convinced of God, I think the feeling in itself becomes the idol. Um, and I come from a tradition uh, where that's quite common. Uh, that, you know, and it, it, I have to say that it's in sync with society today. Um, if I ask uh, people a question, frequently the answer I get is, I feel like, and then the rest of the, of, of the uh, answer. And I have a friend from New Jersey, and no, no offense, but um, he, he finally said, you know, I'm not really interested in what you feel like. I want a factual, objective answer to my question. <laughs> so. So when feelings trump 
our faith. And there are so many times when we don't feel our faith. Absolutely times when uh, there's no feeling there. Um, uh, the well is run dry. Uh, and it is true faith at that point. And one of the things I love about liturgy is that liturgy provides guardrails for those times. Uh, liturgy doesn't care how you feel. Uh, we're going to confess to the Lord, and we're going to proclaim before the Lord, and we're going to receive from the Lord uh, regardless. And I, I tend to be, um, I, I really tend to believe that oftentimes feelings follow action. And during those moments in my life, at least, when I absolutely do not feel anything, uh, two things happen. I learn to rest in my faith, and as was said this morning, I learn to lean in to the faith of you all. Uh, because we believe that when we come together, that every once in a while there will be doubts. And you can bring your doubts uh, and your doubts can easily be covered by the faith of those around you. None of us bat a thousand on an ongoing basis. So it's community as well. So uh, all that to say we can't let feelings uh, become an idol. What does the second commandment teach us about hope? That our hope is in God that our hope is in God. And looking at point 282, it's good to know how idolatry will affect us. How does it affect us? If something has more prominence in our heart and mind than, than God, how does that affect us? Go ahead. It, it does. It separates us. It, it's closer to God than we are, right? Whatever is between us, between God and us, is closer to him. And we see this all the time, people who strive for wealth or relationships that leave them empty. Uh, relationships that fail to realize that God should come first. Um, even, even a relationship, even a, a human love can become idolatrous. Would somebody would like to recite the third commandment. Why is his name, why is God's name sacred? Whenever I see this question, I think of I am, uh, the simple I am. And, um, so much has to remain in mystery, but we know that he is. And the name stands also, <clears throat> as TJ thought, for the total character, more than just your name, it stands for the total person mm -hmm. and their character. Smirch his total character. As opposed to just a person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can read it otherwise as well. That's right. That's right. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so, we'll drop it then. so <laughs> let's forge ahead to point 288 on those thoughts. How might you use God's name carelessly? We often think of cursing. Uh, and that's not the only way. In fact, I know people who would never, ever curse, but they take God's name in vain on a regular basis. So let's look at that uh, in a bit of detail if we can. How might you use God's name carelessly? By improperly representing God more than what he's doing after. Exactly. That's, that's one major way. Another 
another stab at that one. Which reminds me, we shouldn't put the fish symbol on the back of our cars. <laughs> <laughs> <Shh>. <laughs> Twenty years in Mexico City traffic, I've, uh, the hardest thing for me to learn has been not to blow my horn in Springfield, <laughs> because I have had people of every age make obscene gestures at me when I do that. So, um, yeah, I want to throw another one into the pot here on this um, cur uh, on point two eighty eight: cursing, magic, broken vows, false piety manipulation of others. I want us to look at false piety and I want us to look at the ease with which some people say God told me. Okay? I know I don't think she ever said it in these exact words. I think it was a paraphrase of a collection of sayings that's attributed to her, Mother Teresa, uh, saying God spoke to me once and I never heard from him again. And the point she was trying to make is the point that I make all of, all of the time. 99% of what God will say to us, he has already said through the scripture. Okay? Uh, and when we are quick to say God said, or even God's leading, um, I, I can't think of a mountain of times in my life where I can be absolutely sure that God was saying something specific to me uh, when it wasn't just the scripture really speaking loud and clear. Uh, I did have one of those times not long ago and it, it, it was absolutely wonderful, uh, but they don't come. Maybe I'm unspiritual. You're supposed to, you're supposed to say no, that's not, that, no, that's not the case. <laughs> but, um, I think that it's uh, one of the things that we have to understand is that so many times when we struggle uh, and, and want to be able to say God has said or God has spoken, he already really has. And it's just simply, and he probably has already given a desire, if it's a proactive action or if it's something we need to curb or to abolish from our, from our life, he probably has already made that clear in other ways as well. So manipulation, I think, we, we, we're taught, we hear a lot about spiritual abuse these days. And so when we, when we look at, uh, at in the arenas where we're seeing spiritual abuse surface in, the, in some of the mega churches and somewhat, the, the manipulation that it takes is very clear. Um, and I think that we, we understand that's taking God's name in vain. It's cheapening uh, the name of God before the world. If somebody would read the fourth commandment, please. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Okay. Uh, of course, uh, Israel uh, had a variety of uh, subpoints on that that were developed on how you keep the Sabbath and then uh, that was one of the points of the Ten Commandments that Jesus, that we are taught that he fulfilled, not that we shouldn't have a Sabbath, uh, but that it looks different these days. Is Sunday always our Sabbath? Sure isn't mine. No, but is, it is important to keep a Sabbath, I believe. I believe that and, uh, aside from the biblical commandment of needing to have a day of rest, and I do love, I love the way uh, Jews celebrate the Sabbath, uh, the whole idea of Shabbat and celebrating, and Pam and I try to do that um, most of the time on Saturday, and it, it, it means a special food, it means taking joy in, in certain things, uh, and I love the idea of Shabbat, uh, and I, but it, it does look, certainly look different. Uh, but I think when we fail to have a day of rest, uh, even uh, studies that have nothing to do with God or the church will, uh, will verify that we do it uh, at our own harm. So Sabbath is important. I just wanted to say that there's so many people that are caretakers of elderly parents or of other family members that are quite ill, and they work really, really hard. 
You have to provide standby assistance sometimes 24 hours a day. Yeah. You have to do all manner of other things for that person who is sick. But if they don't take some time for themselves when they become sick, and it's not possible then for them to do anything, I think I have that conversation in my office with patients at least 10 times every week, asking people, encouraging people to please set aside at least four hours twice a week to just do something that a human being might do. Sit in the park, visit a friend, have lunch, go shopping, walk the dog, just get out of there. And yeah. really, four hours is absolutely minimum twice a week. People get sick from simply being physically sick. Unable to. So it's important to remember that, uh, that Sabbath is not just a day of rest. It is also a day of celebration. We celebrate what he's given us. And uh, I, I don't think there's probably uh, a better pop writing on the Sabbath than uh, Pete Scazzaro has written a book called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. And um, uh, Pete was pastoring a large church and things fell apart. He had to go to the board and tell them that his wife was quitting church because she didn't like going to church anymore. And all of that caused a great deal of embarrassment and, and the board uh, decided they needed time to rest. And out of that, he wrote a series of books called, uh, the, the primer is Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. There's one called Emotionally Healthy Leadership, several. But in his Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, he talks about uh, the Sabbath uh, in a holistic way. And it's, uh, it's a great piece. I encourage you to read it if you haven't. If somebody would recite the fifth commandment, I love the fact that the catechism really has broadened this one. Um, it says here, I should love, serve, respect, and care for my parents all their lives and should obey them in all things that are reasonable and conform to God's law. I like the reasonable part. <laughs> they, they allowed. Um, <laughs> depending on whether you're the parent or the child. Um, and of course, we as parents, we have, uh, we have responsibility to our children and to our grandchildren. And if, we have, if you have great-grandchildren, to them as well. Um, and we see in 303 how Jesus kept that commandment um, by obeying Joseph and Mary. Uh, on, uh, on the cross, he provided for his mother by entrusting her to his disciples' care. So uh, in the very worst moments possible, he was still providing for his mother. Um, I think that uh, I, I like the way that the catechism has broadened this a bit to include others because I, I have friends whose relationship with their parents, uh, unfortunately, uh, was not only negative, it was just not sustainable. And they came to a point where they had to uh, protect themselves, preserve their lives, and turn and walk away. And those, those things can happen. Uh, and it seems like God is faithful to put parental figures uh, in their lives. And so we see that they uh, sometimes assume a responsibility towards those people uh, that would normally be uh, directed to their biological parents. So there are, of course, nuances with this that um, if... Children have parents who have been abusive or uh, f fail in the relationship to the point that the relationship is not sustainable, then we understand that we, we only have control over ourselves. Uh, we don't have control over others. And God makes a provision for that, I believe. We're getting ready to cover the second half of the Ten Commandments. Does anybody have a question or a comment? that you'd like to make uh, with regard to the first five. Okay, I feel spiritual. <laughs> the five convinced me. Do we have to okay. do more? <laughs> <laughs> There's 10. Somebody had a question. Yes. Um, uh, 
Brittany. Icons. And the answer to that is yes. <laughs> so, no, no. So one of the things, we, we, we hear a lot of talk about the big tent in Anglicanism. You have, uh, I, I will quote in my sermon this morning, Simeon Zoll. Simeon Zoll would be on the evangelical side and would, would not... Um, would not identify as Anglo-Catholic at all. I think, uh, and uh, Deacon Robert and Father Jim can guide me in this, but I, I think that Bishop Frank has described our church uh, according to the, uh, the founding priest, uh, Doug McGlynn. He was, he was a unique combination of the three threads of Anglicanism. Um, he fully embraced the charismatic movement and healing of bodies and glossolalia and all of those things. He was completely evangelical and he was Anglo-Catholic. Uh, he, he brought all three streams. So if you, so we're a complex lot at All Saints. And you'll see all three of those streams fully functioning uh, if you're here. And so, um, I had a discussion with somebody this week, and they may even be in this room when we talk about uh, talk about icons. But um, I tend to I tend to value icons because uh, the question I have to ask myself is, what happens when I look at a statue of Christ? Well, that draws me to Christ. Uh, I see no value, inerrant value, in that statue other than the fact that it draws me to Christ. If you walk into my study. You'll see above the sofa a large picture of Christ that was done by a personal friend 40 to 50 years ago, 50 years ago. And it's a unique picture of the crucifixion where Christ is watching the nail go in his hand. I'm reminded of the price he paid for me. Uh, and so my, uh, my answer to that is, and, and I spent 20 years in an evangelical church in Mexico that would absolutely be where your Baptist friends are and that is any icon shouldn't be used just because some people uh, choose to worship it. And my answer to that is we have plenty of people who choose to worship their pastor and we don't eliminate him. Uh, we, have, we have plenty of people who choose to, to worship all kinds of things in the church and we don't eliminate those. Uh, we teach a good Christology and who is to be worshiped. And I think iconism, I, I tend to enjoy uh, icons uh, because across the board, uh, they draw me to Christ. I, I could, if I were on an island, I could survive without them. Uh, that wouldn't be a problem. Uh, but I think that's the answer. What, to whom or to what does that icon serve? And I think uh, icons have historically served a very solid purpose of drawing people into a more contemplative time with Christ. Now, if they're being worshiped, and they sometimes are, uh, in, in certain traditions throughout the world, then of course, it becomes idolatry at that point. Steve. Well, people focus the icon on the person, but the cross is an icon. It's not the literal cross you die on, it's an icon. It's an icon, yeah. We would be hard pressed to find any Protestant church that didn't have icons, the altar, can be an icon. Uh, so, uh, but I do get what they're saying. And, um, uh, and I, it seems to me the more, um, I, I served in a very Catholic uh, country for 20 years and it was Catholic, Latino Catholic, which is a bit different than Roman Catholic. Uh, you don't hear a lot about the Virgin Guadalupe 
uh, in Roman Catholicism, but you better believe that it's present everywhere in Latino Catholicism. And so I've seen, uh, I've seen idolatry uh, in the form of iconism, uh, but I've also seen healthy uh, aspects of reminders. This, this should draw us. Yes. Yeah, and I appreciate that. That that resonates with me. That's part of my history. But I think I, what what I found is that the, the evangelical churches in those countries tend to go way over on the other side, uh, to the point of becoming legalistic in that direction, uh, and not enjoying something that could draw them, uh, serve it to draw them to Christ. Okay. Yes. That's right, that's right. Um, the use of candles. Um, whenever I walk into a Catholic church for prayer, if I'm traveling, um, uh, I, will, I will sometimes light a candle as I'm praying for a particular thing. That's for me. God doesn't need to see the candle. That, that candle is my step, step of faith in remembrance. So I, I think that uh, use, how we use, now, sometimes I don't have the money if it's one that the little battery operated ones and you have to deposit a, a coin, but anyhow. Let's look at the sixth commandment. Um, what is murder? Point 308, murder is the willful and unjust taking of human life. And we know that God prohibits murder because in his eyes, every human being is made in his image all human life is sacred from conception to natural death. And this, of course, we, we, we are a pro-life church. Uh, now, I will open and close this can of worms. Uh, we are pro-life in that we, we are not in favor of abortion. Um, some would define pro-life as being also against capital punishment. And that's where I'm going to close the can because that would be a discussion too lengthy to get into. But when you use the term pro-life, you have to understand that that means something different to everybody. Uh, there, there are many, many people, good, solid, uh, believing people that are absolutely against capital punishment and many, many good, solid, believing people that have come to the conclusion that there are times when it's justified. So we'll... We'll not get into that, but understand that pro-life can, can uh, there are some nuances there. Um, other actions that are considered murder, genocide, infanticide, abortion, suicide, and euthanasia are all forms of murder. Um, and then signs of murderous intent include physical and emotional abuse, abandonment, willful negligence, and wanton recklessness. That is, in other words, that's flirting uh, with murder or with harming the life of somebody. 
Point 311 is an interesting one. How did Jesus extend the law against murder? Somebody want to read that? We can, by our words, murder the reputation of people. We can, we can murder their spirit by lying and by uh, creating uh, stories that aren't accurate. So uh, it's, it is broadened. Is, uh, is anger always sinful? Now, uh, for those of you that never met uh, Father Ben Jeffries, he was the assisting priest under Father Doug McGlynn, and I've heard Father, uh, Father Ben say, I'm not sure I've ever witnessed righteous anger. <laughs> and I got what he was saying. It's pretty rare. Uh, the times when I've told myself that that was righteous anger, eh, it was probably not exactly. So... Um, Is it always wrong to harm or kill another? And my mind always goes to Diedrich Bonhoeffer, um, who was involved in a plot to assassinate Hitler. And uh, had he lived to be 60 or 70, I, uh, I cannot imagine what theology he would have written. He died at, I believe, 39. And so um, he felt that angst, and I believe he said, I believe this is a correct quote, I do believe that God will judge me for what I'm doing, but I also believe that there is no right action in this particular case. And that was the complexity of the Holocaust. Let's go to the seventh commandment. Would somebody read that, please? Okay. I think it's important to um, immediately look at what, how Jesus defined adultery. Now, we know that the physical act carries much broader ramifications than committing adultery in one's heart. Uh, but he did hone in on something here uh, because, the, uh, of course, I'm sure that the Jews were living by the letter of the law. You can do everything shy of. That's human tendency, isn't it? Uh, Jesus taught that even to look at another person with lust violates this commandment. Adultery begins with a lustful heart, but the Lord calls us to be chaste. What does it mean to be chaste? Point 320, whether I'm married or single, it means I will love and honor others as image bearers of God, not as objects of lust and sexual gratification. And I will refrain from all sexual acts outside of marriage. And here we see uh, clearly how the viewing of pornography uh, works into not honoring that others are image bearers. Pornography is not only uh, sinful from the aspect of, of lust, it objectifies other people who frequently uh, are in very, a very vulnerable state, uh, so um, especially in foreign countries. going to refer to something that Father Ben, he gets two points, you'll have to tell him tonight, twice in one lesson. Um, the, uh, probably the best message I ever heard on human sexuality, and I haven't heard that many, uh, not, uh, there aren't a lot of uh, pastors who have the intestinal fortitude to preach a message on sexuality, uh, but Father Ben did hear once in the church, and um, I'll never forget uh, that we had a young lady who was visiting with us. This would have been probably 2015. And he, um, he just began to um, give a list. <laughs> These are all sexual sins. And he, it was a long list. And uh, now with the advance of technology, it's gotten even much longer. But 
Um, he, he gave this list and uh, the young lady who was visiting with us was much more progressive minded than we are, I'm sure, with regard to sexuality. And I asked her how that sermon landed on her and she said, I liked that. And I realized what she had liked was what the sermon didn't have. It didn't have the cheap rhetoric of singling out one or two sexual sins and giving ourselves a pass because we don't commit those sexual sins. He was very detailed in his sermon and it was very uncomfortable and there was lots of squirming. But, but the end effect of that was that everybody got the message. We all are broken vessels and probably nowhere in our lives is that more evident than in sexuality collectively. Um, so I think that's a good thing to remember. God has ordained marriage, uh, and he's ordained marriage between uh, one husband and one wife, uh, and his design is for a lifetime, but we, we do know that sometimes that doesn't happen, and we do know that the, the scripture does address that uh, in times when the divorce is permissible. So I think it's uh, when we look at a society that is as sexualized as our society is these days, coming back to the basics of this is what God has ordained is great for all of us. Uh, and understanding that the way that somebody is deviating from that is no more a sin than the way we may be deviating from it, just because it's falling in a different category. Now, the ramifications may be more severe but uh, he gives one pattern for healthy sexuality. I like 327, how should a single person keep the seventh commandment? By honoring uh, as holy their own bodies and those of others by refraining from sexual acts, lewd speech, or lustful thoughts. They should nurture, chaste, and loyal friendships and uphold the common life of their families, fellowships, and churches. <clears throat> Somebody like to recite the Eighth Commandment? Defined as the unauthorized and willful taking of what rightly belongs to another. Now we immediately go to material possessions, but stealing is much more holistic than that. Uh, it can be intellectual property. It can be um, it can be cheating cheating on our taxes, cheating in school, like, uh, you know, anything, any attempt that we make to get something that uh, is not ours uh, in an unlawful way. Um, plagiarism, once again, stealing. Anybody else want to venture other ways of stealing? You can you can rob them of their good name for sure. Point 336 says, God, <clears throat> God desires that I be content, responsible, and generous with what he has given me. Everything I own, I hold in trust as God's steward to cultivate and use for his glory and my neighbor's good. Basically, the point here is very simple. Um, uh, we, we hold on to all of our belongings with loose hands, and the antithesis of stealing is generosity, of being generous of heart. Somebody like to recite the ninth commandment. It's again lying, simple lying. Um, something that we think maybe is true or might be true or we, I, I like, we feel like it's true. <laughs> Good old subjectivity of feelings, right? Uh, so we do not want to bear false witness against our neighbor. We, in fact, to the contrary, we should give them the benefit of the doubt. Uh, I've never ever regretted giving the benefit of the doubt, but I've regretted jumping to conclusions more times than I can remember. We're going to the last commandment, the 10th commandment, would somebody like to read that? It's point 349. You shall not covet anything that is your own. 
And I'm going to end our class by going to point 351 and saying it forbids me to covet my neighbor's property, possessions, relationships, or status, or anything else that is my neighbor's, not just property. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right when you think you're doing okay, you read the 10th one. Uh, I want to remind everybody today to join the online directory if you haven't already. Uh, we want to make sure we get right names with right faces. All right. Father Jim, would you dismiss us in a word of prayer, please? Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us the commandment because we cannot guide ourselves. We need your guidance in all that we do. We live in a fallen world. We are not made perfect, but you desire for us to grow more and more like your Son, our Savior, Jesus. So Lord, I ask that you lead us to follow more closely your commandments, to read them, ponder them, to look at them, and to do those things that we may do, and to call upon you to help us in being more righteous and more holy. In Jesus' name I pray.